want to welcome all of you to the meeting of Stuart and Heritage. Uh, this looks like one of our old crowds. It doesn't really look like one of our new crowds, huh? I guess it was raining tonight. Nobody wanted to come out. But Alice has a great program for us. I want to go over a couple of things that are going on. Um, we have several events planned. I don't know how many of you know this, but as of December 31st, this will be off of Stewart Main Street. It will no longer be the Flagler Place. It will be the Flagler Center. So um, there's going to be a transition time. Come on in. Uh, there will be a transition time in January where we will not be able to use this. There will be this will all be going to go with the uh, way that has it now, so there will be new equipment put in, new chairs, lots of renovations. So our January program is uh, still in the works. We'll let you know about that. Um, our November program is Sandy Thurlow just arrived. She has talked to Paul Iron, and he's going to do it on the state program, Sandy. Also was uh, in charge of Alport Marine. Okay, he was also in charge of Alport Marine, so he will speak about that. Uh, in December, we are going to have what we always have. That will be our last event here for a couple of months. We will have our holiday open house. Uh, there's going to be some special things for that. We'll let you know. One of the special things is Alice. Lockhart and Sandy Thurlow are going to be doing the tours again. Three tours, one at 10, one at 1130, and one at 1. And it will be just like we did in May. They will be um, escorted two by Alice, one by Sandy. And we hope that if you want to take one, you will sign up. They can only take 20. So that will be a total of 60 people. But we will have an open house. And like we always do, and it will announce in the next newsletter what all is going to be going on that day besides the tours. In January, we are going to have uh, a program that I don't know what it is yet, but we will let you know. Uh, we're waiting on some approval of Gloria, Mike, and Barbara are in charge of that, so they will let us know. February will be Black History Month with. Faye James and her two sons, and she has been working on it since last summer, so it ought to be a great program. After that, there are things planned, but we do not have um, completely all of the programs that go with it. So just plan on coming out to all of our programs, and we're going to try and do some really good ones. Sandy Thurlow and Alice McCart have really been good this year to pick up. I was burnt, program burnt out. I couldn't think after I've been here almost 10 years of, of trying to get programs. I was like, okay, what do we do next? And they stepped up and they've taken it over. So um, I would love for you all to come out and see the museum. Uh, we have done a lot of work there. It's all decorated for fall. And um, you should come and bring friends and see what's been done. And Wednesday mornings are very busy. There's a lot of people there. And I would love for some more to come out and fill it up. I want to turn the meeting over to Alice. But she's going to do a program on Furby Ferguson and sports history. And then there'll be a, a break, and then she's got a surprise for us, so she's actually going to do two short programs. Okay, I'll show you. Thank you, Mary. Evening, everybody. Um, one of my favorite topics to do is on Fergie Ferguson. And I know there's some people who actually knew Fergie personally, right? Anybody else? I know Mary was. Oh, look at this, quite a few. Very good. And even though I had done a program a number of years ago on Fergie, I've gotten some more additional material and photographs, so I want to put it together as a video. 
So before I've been doing PowerPoints, but this is a video, so it always makes it kind of nice to do it that way. But just a fascinating story. A local boy who becomes not only a sports hero, but then a D-Day hero during the war. And just, you know, we can be so proud of him. And if you remember, we also got the city to name the gazebo, right down there where uh, close to City Hall is and close beyond where the courthouse is, and named for Fergie. So there's a permanent monument then to him that way. So it's just a fascinating story. We're going to go through, I'm going to take you through the whole life and times of this video that I created. And then afterwards, we'll take questions and answers. Anybody got anything that you want clarification on? And then Rick Miller and I have something very special to show you. So don't get up yet after for the questions and answers. There's something very special. A little, you're going to be the premier group to see this item. Nobody else has seen it yet. We're only going to do a snippet of it, so just to give you a taste. But it, it is quite, uh, quite good, and I think you will enjoy it. So um, we're ready to start our video. Life and Times of Fergie. The Life and Times of Fergie Ferguson is who we're going to recognize today. a sports hero, and during the Second World War, a war hero. Fergie was born June 21st in 1919 in Jacksonville. His parents were four, Senior and Francis. His two siblings, Aurora, born 1916, and Wilbur, born in 1921, also were from Jacksonville. Here was the two boys, Fergie on the left and his brother Wilbur on the right. Here are all three of the children after they moved from Jacksonville to Jensen. Fergie grew up in Jensen and attended the elementary school there. The Jensen Arch and the Jensen Train Depot were all familiar sites for the Ferguson family. In 1934, Fergie started attending the only high school in the county, Seward High School, located on East 4th Street, later named East Ocean Boulevard. With so many high school athletic programs at the school, the family decided to move to Stewart so Fergie would be closer to his school. The family became very familiar with all the places and businesses in downtown. The Ferguson family settled into a two-story house on Camden Avenue. It was right across from the Knapp Apartments. Football was Fergie's big sports love. By 1936, his brother Wilbur also was on the SHS team. Their football coach was J. Fred Evans. It wasn't just Fergie, but all the players mattered. In a November 1936 game against Lake Worth, player Elmer Rico was confused if he was to play or not, and so he didn't go to Lake Worth. The coach sent for Herbert Bruner to go and get Rico. Stewart tried to delay the game as much as possible. With the game finally started, it was Fergie who stated he was injured in the very first play, so further delaying the game. This allowed Bruner and Rico to arrive and get set up for the game. It proved to be a very successful trick by Fergie to help his classmates. The school had not had a winning football season in many years, and that was about to change. In 1937, the school won the Southeast Coast Conference, their first championship. Many contributed success to Fergie. He was that curly-haired giant, 
star player who indeed inspired the other players. Fergie completed all his studies and graduated on May 27, 1938. It was a class of 20 fellow students. Stuart's golden son, who everyone felt would accomplish great things. He attended the University of Florida in Gainesville and played college football now. Ferguson continued the Ferguson tradition and played center for the Stewart High School. The coach considered Wilbur a very wiry player. His skill as a Gator player was his ability to play offensive and defensive end positions. The Gator football team, with all its strong players, seemed unbeatable. That was especially true October 19, 1939 game against Boston College. It was a strong and hard game, but University of Florida defeated Boston 7 to 0. In the 1939-40 season, Fergie managed to catch 43 passes. In 1941, he made a complete touchdown pass of 74 yards, the longest on record. It remained unbroken until 1954. Fergie was named All-Southeastern Conference Player, with honorable mention for All-American in the nation in 1941. Not playing football, Fergie lettered in track and field events. He played on the University of Florida's baseball team also. In 1940, he won the Collegiate State Boxing Championship. In 1942, he won the National AAU Javelin Throw Championship. He loved playing sports. Didn't matter what it was, he was involved. Whatever he attempted in sports, Fergie excelled at. Playing football the best, and he knew what were good plays. his long arms and large hands, he was a natural at catching passes. In 1941, when UF beat the University of Miami in their home stadium of Miami, the local Miami Herald had to print, Florida whips Miami 14 to zero. Ferguson did it single-handedly. May 25th, 1942, Fergie had also earned his Bachelor's of Arts degree in education from the University of Florida. If it had not been 1942, a different path may have opened up for Fergie. He would have been a prime candidate for professional National Football League draft. But because the United States was at war, Fergie willingly took the path of enlisting in the United States Army. In June, he reported to the 318th Field Artillery Battery 81st Division. He had the basic military training, but the Army also wanted Fergie on the Army All-Stars football team. That team played the professionals of the NFL teams all across the country. His coach was Wallace Wade. In Fergie's travels, he met many celebrities, such as actress Linda Darnell. He was also at the Rose Bowl in California. After the Army football season, Fergie attended Officer Candidate School and became a second lieutenant by July 1943. Stewart's golden boy continued to shine, and he was always welcomed back to cheering crowds on his furlough visits to Stewart. His parents and siblings were also very proud of Fergie. Mother Wilbur finished school and went into the military. He then married Kathleen Bullard, in 1943, and in the next few years, they had two daughters, Kay Francis and Deborah Ann. By late 1943, Fergie was sent to England to finish training for the upcoming D-Day invasion.
Even while training in England, he played on the 29th Infantry Division Blues football team. They beat every team they played. There were parades of the American soldiers through the streets of London. During one of those parades that Fergie was in, he wanted to reassure the English citizens. As he marched, he could be heard yelling, Englishmen never fear, Fergie Ferguson is here. As Operation Overlord, T-Day, approached to push the Germans out of France, the troops marched to the loading docks. Ships and transports were loaded. England had three beaches to land on on the Normandy coasts of France. The United States had three beaches and Canada one beach. It was June 6, 1944. Perky had hoped to be in the first wave of Americans onto the coast but had been reassigned back in May to be with the second wave. The Americans came at low tide, 6 a.m., onto one of the beaches, Omaha Beach. With so much beach area to cross, they were exposed to unending German firebombs and artillery. It became known as the Suicide Wave. Soldiers trying to come on shore were exposed to countless rounds of German gunfire. U.S. Army Lieutenant General Omar Bradley was watching on a ship offshore. He knew it looked hopeless and was about to call the invasion off. He then observed Lieutenant Ferguson and his men entering the beach as the second wave. Fergie knew it was a dangerous situation. He rigged a long, pipe-like bomb of explosive charges. He went with other soldiers to the Bob Wire fortification. He inserted the Bangalore torpedo. Next, an explosion. An opening was created. Fergie directed his men to move forward, off the beach. General Bradley witnessed this and sent in reinforcements. The tide of the invasion was turning. Suddenly, Fergie was struck by shrapnel in his head and his leg. He was alive, but had to wait for the medics. Many wounded and dead Americans on Omaha Beach that day. If those scenes look familiar, they are from the opening of the 1998 movie Saving Private Ryan. Same battle scenes that Fergie and others faced. Actor Tom Hanks did those opening scenes, reenacting what Fergie had done. The Hanks character would go on to achieve other things throughout the movie. Not true for Fergie. He eventually was transported to an English hospital. He was unconscious there for two months. Later, he was transported to Atlanta, Georgia, to the Lawson VA Hospital for additional surgery. For his bravery, Fergie was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross Medal on December 20, 1944, and then made a first lieutenant. This is the second highest award given to a member of the United States Army. It is for extreme gallantry and risk of life in actual combat with an armed enemy force. It is a bronze cross with an eagle in the center and the inscription for valor. 
Only 5,000 were awarded during all of World War II. Fergie made the front page headlines of the Stuart News. He was discharged from the military on March 20, 1945, and returned back to Stuart. Fergie was welcomed back to Stuart with open arms. All of the people in the county were proud of their golden boy. He was home to all the familiar places, downtown Stewart, Lighthouse Restaurant, the Lyric Theater. Back home to his parents' house on Camden Avenue. The hospitals in 1944 could only do so much. He did have a metal plate in his head. He suffered from speech problems and his movements were slow and difficult for him. His sister Aurora helped look after Fergie. All of Stuart was very respectful and assisted him whenever possible. Still physically a big fella, he did want to find something he could do. The American Legion State Conference honored him with a parade in May of 1946 held in West Palm Beach. He was accompanied by the Stewart High School Band. A big opportunity came in 1946 when a semi-pro veterans football team for Stewart was created. He served as their coach. That was the one skill he retained, football plays. The Stewart team of veterans had two good winning seasons. There were good days and bad days for Fergie related to his health. By 1950, he did become the coaching consultant for the Stewart High School football team, though. He was always calm and very laid back with the students. He loved his family also especially his two young nieces, Kay and Deborah. Tragically, Fergie's father passed away in August of 1952. For some much needed family time, Fergie, his mom, and sister Aurora went on a two month cross country road trip in May of 53. Fergie really enjoyed seeing New Mexico and Arizona. By late 1953 and back home, Fergie developed a brain infection. He also got the flu and had to be admitted to the VA hospital in Coral Gables in Dade County. On January 7, 1954, he lapsed into a coma at the hospital. His mother, Aurora, and Wilbur stayed by his side. Fergie died May 15, 1954. As was stated by his family and friends, Fergie never complained. His body was brought back by train from Miami to Stewart. Aurora was devastated by Fergie's passing. It was said that a vast sadness in her heart never left her. This same sadness was felt all over Martin County. All businesses closed on May 20th during Fergie's funeral service, which was held at the Stuart Baptist Church. The church was filled with mourners and then another 150 people standing outside. The military funeral and burial was conducted at All Saints Cemetery in Judson Beach. The Harold Johns American Legion Post 62 conducted the services.
with Fergie's passing, the University of Florida remembered its hero alumni. A special award has been given every year to a senior UF football player who displays outstanding leadership, character, and courage. This first one was awarded then in 1955. Other honors included Fergie's name being placed in the Florida Sports Hall of Fame. Fergie has been the only athlete from Martin County. Over the years, the Ferguson family has carried on. Fergie's mother died in 1980, brother Wilbur in 1987, and sister Aurora died in 2009. As the decades went by, Fergie was not forgotten in Martin County. A new award, the Fergie Ferguson County Football Championship Trophy, was started in 2013. Jensen Beach High School was the first winner of that trophy. The high school in Martin County with the most wins in a season had been awarded the trophy. In 2014, the city of Stewart decided to rename the majestic white bandstand in Gazebo Park after Fergie. Memorial Day 2015 was the dedication of that plaque and the renaming officially of the bandstand. In attendance that day were Fergie's two nieces, Deborah and Kay, who came from their home in Mississippi. They spoke of their pride of their uncle and how pleased they were Stuart was honoring him. The bronze plaque showed the city seal and an image of the Distinguished Service Cross Medal. It proved to be a very special day to remember a local hero. The plaque is embedded in a large stone in front of the bandstand. Joining the nieces were Joe Crankshaw, Alice Luckhart, and Bob D'Angelo. On Camden today, the former Ferguson home still stands. Another remembrance of Fergie is a book written in 2015 by Bob D'Angelo. With detailed research, especially covering Fergie's football achievements and his war experiences are all found in this book by Bob. Former sports reporter for the Stuart News, Bob now lives in Tampa. This June 2019 marks Fergie's 100th birthday anniversary. June 6 marks the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And May 2019 marks the 65th anniversary of Fergie's death. If he is remembered, Fergie lives forever. We have Tom Thurlow here, who is one of those high school students that was trained under Fergie as a football player. So, I mean, there's a good example of what he grew up into and from some of that training that he got as a football player. And then, of course, as we know, many people here knew him in the community. You know, he was a good guy. People respected him. There was no making fun of him, you know, just because of his disabilities. So they knew what they had. They had a proud American, a local boy. Now, any questions from anyone? 
Yes, Andy. I congratulate you on getting the additional photographs and like the one of him getting the medal. Did you mm -hmm. get that from the nieces? Or? Uh, I, uh, see, I can't remember that was one from the nieces were some that Bob D'Angelo was able to get hold of too. He got a hold of love and he assisted me on getting some of these extra ones. So. I don't remember that one in his book. Yeah. That well, then really nice. from the nieces. Really I'm still in contact with the nieces. They have been back down since the dedication in 2015, but we still communicate. You know, back and forth. So they still live in Delaware. Yes, yes, they're still in Mississippi. So Other questions? Yes. Yeah. So he's still buried. At, I mean, he's still buried. He's buried at All Saints. <laughs> yes. Where was it? Like in an uh, approximation to the church? I can't. It's, it is a distance from the church, but I'm not familiar with which section to say that he's in. Um, you know, we have uh, Joyce Bernard Fletcher, who's the historian for All Saints Church, and I know she knows where all of these are. And she's going to be doing, by the way, coming in the new year, a historic program where she takes you on a tour of the cemetery and points out some of the famous people. And her, he is one of them. It looks she's like going to be covered. Little part. It might be on the slope. I don't think they had it up on the hill back in. Right. It's kind of if you see the river. That's in the yeah. It's going to be down on the little part. About that, where the church is. <laughs> Other questions, Sandy? Is there a duplicate of the um, of the plaque at the feed store? Yes, and there is. How is that? How do you? Oh, they're so expensive. Do it in the window, 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 window for the display because of this program. But see, uh, Mary, if you remember how that happened? The city, of course, did up the plaque, got everything, and then they looked at it again and they realized the city seal was slightly turned. It's supposed to be a certain way, and so they couldn't allow that. So they had, to, they didn't want to get rid of it, so they offered it to us at the museum, so we said, oh yeah, and they had to make a whole new one. Uh -huh. So the one that is actually on the stone there by the gazebo is correct, and the city seal is turned the right way. <laughs> so that's how we were able to get an extra one, which is great for us. <laughs> Question? You know, yes, uh, the funeral, the church where his funeral was held, is it still standing, or was it? Mm -hmm. Now, it was, it, you have two back, you have, two versions of the Baptist Church. We have the older one and the more recent one. The one that's there now, the Stuart Baptist Church, 3rd Street, 4th Street, all that area, um, that was built in 64. So the funeral, of course, was in 54. Okay. So it's not the same church, but it's the same area where the same congregation, the uh, Stuart Baptist Church. They had a different building, and they just got a new building in um, 64. What's there now? Where is the church? Where was it held? I mean, where is the location now? Where? The church now, um, Where is third, third Street, uh, very close to Woodman Hall. Okay, okay. Where Woodman oh, Hall is close to the railroad tracks. Okay. Nice. Yeah, once you get into that area, West Fourth Street or West Ocean and Third Street, yeah. where Woodman Hall is, you can see it's a great big church, so it's easy to spot. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, this next program that we're going to be doing is uh, in connection. It's uh, Rick Miller and myself. It was Rick Miller's idea audio man here. He came up with this idea that uh, the big statues, we have five of them throughout the, camp, the city, and these statues are sailfish, like seven feet tall, and they have a historical plaque on them and photographs. And what it does is mark wherever that statue is, what historical events and places are nearby, you know, within sight of. And they've been up there for a number of years. A lot of people have seen them. That, <laughs> A couple of even got damaged and had to be redone again, but you know, we have all five of them up there now. But Rick came up with the idea of let's really showcase these statues. We can show them at you know, uh, Chamber of Commerce meetings and stuff like that and tell the story behind them. You know, it's not just seeing these statues, but seeing the history behind them. And he uses what's known as 3D to help really visualize because some of this, you know, you can't show everything that's there now. You need to know the backstory. So this is where he's added the 3D to make the backstory. So you guys, like I said, are very lucky you're getting to see a snippet, this is not all of it, of the five statues. He covers the introduction and then the first statue so that you get an idea of what we've done. And he'll have it done available shortly so everybody can see it. And you know, maybe even be on YouTube and then you can share it with other friends. So it's a nice overview of the history of this area with those statues. So Rick, whenever you're ready,
available that everybody can download it or you know, YouTube and send it to your friends. It's a great way to kind of showcase Stewart, the, especially the downtown section. And I know you'll want to go and look at some of these uh, statues yourself. Anybody with questions? It seems like they're just the five. No, they're five. Right just the five. Yeah. Originally the idea with uh, Stewart Main Street was that they would do five, then do another five, and then another five. Well, the problem is those statues are not cheap. <laughs> Each one has a different sponsor who help pay for it. But unfortunately, just, you know, they tapped all of those sponsors out on the first five and don't really been able to find enough money to do it again. There's not been any talk of doing another five. Well, we have plenty of places we could do, trust me, but uh, at least we have this five. I wonder if the tram, tram operators of the drivers are reversed in the statues and we can give you know, talks to visitors about those? Well, how much they do, it varies from obviously driver to driver. Some probably know a little bit more than others. And again, yeah, we want to make this available to the city, EULA, and to other groups. And that, you know, the tram drivers should definitely see some of this information and, and uh, make sure they read those statues. And uh, yes, the, the cool thing about it, it's really hard to see on a regular screen like this, but I was move, moving it around. I was moving it around so you could see it. Um, in the city annex, the plan is to have a, if any of you have seen the VR headset, put the headset on, you'll be able to sit and you'll be able to watch it. If you haven't experienced it, it's something really cool. It's like you're standing at each of the statues and you can look around yourself. Alice tried it out. It was amazing. And if you've never tried it, um, we'll do a, an email once, once the system's set up and hopefully, uh, and it'll be free to just come in trying to show off our city a little bit, something different for people to come in. And um, you know, you can get brochures and all that, which is great information about the city, but just, just a step further, something unique that's uh, brand new technology. So. And like you see, he embedded some of those photographs in there. So if you're covering about Grover Cleveland or 
the you know original St. Lucie Annex Hotel. You know, there's a picture of it there where it would have been, you know, at that time when it did exist. So it's neat, and he's, when he was moving it, that's him moving it. So if you have it on your machine where you're using YouTube, you can do it. So if you want to go back and look at it six times, you can. That's the beauty of it. So it's not just a film that goes, that's it, and you have to start all over again. No, you can do it just as you're looking at each item, each of those. Will these, yes. will these be on the city of Stewart um, website? We have to see what the city does, you know, when he's ready to give it. <laughs> I guess I wish you had to push your ear. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, when I was a kid there, they used to call Bosco the Pond. They said, that's where the hospital got rid of the parts and cut off. <laughs> so it's a hospital pond. And those who aren't familiar with it, it's down East Ocean, right uh, close to uh, Palm Beach Road. It was um, Hospital Lake or Hospital Pond. It's been known ever since you had a hospital nearby. You know, it started in 1926. Um, but as Sid was saying, he said, he got that name because of the Oh, they parts they dumped the parts. They dumped the parts in the pot. Oh. <laughs> but that's it. We have to look at our source. We have to look at our source. <laughs> Other questions from anybody? Right <laughs> yes, something that may not be um, uh, uh, at the call. Do you know the couple that's on that uh, call page there? Oh, <laughs> I think we'd have to check with the people here, because obviously that's their web page. Their web, yeah, oh, yeah. No, I don't know who they are. I thought maybe we were supposed to know who that was. Well, again, because it's on their, you know, uh, computer home page. When they, before they start something else, it's going to be up there. Like a cruise ship, come on. But like a cruise ship, you said. Yeah. But remember, they do weddings here, so that's probably why they, you know, so they that way. To help make people more aware of you know, the, the areas outside. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. So, like I said, that's Rex I did. He did a wonderful job, and it's almost done. Yes, but maybe it could be a requisite that all the two trolley drivers have to know those facts <coughs> before they do a job like that. Yeah. Well, they are. They are taught. I'm not saying they don't know. Some know more than others. Um, but you know, like Sandy and I, we've been doing this for years and we still don't know everything. We're still learning stuff. So we don't. <laughs> don't know no, she says we don't know. <laughs> we don't know everything. I can't believe it. You right. don't know everything. But Sandy, are we still learning new things all the time? Indeed. Yes. And forget them. <laughs> oh yeah. But that's fun. That's the fun thing, is stumbling on something we never knew before. You know, the historical vignettes that Greg and I do. When we started that in 2012, not that long ago, again, this is Stuart, you know, Greg, the Stuart boy. He says, oh, goodness, we'll only have enough maybe since we're doing it weekly for maybe six months. That's all I can figure we'll ever remember or know about Stuart. We'll cover six months worth of every, every Wednesday. Well, again, that was 2012. We're still doing it every Wednesday. We're still coming up with stories. So that's the beauty. There are plenty of things. And I know we're not even touching on everything by a long shot. You know, but what we're trying to do is that forgotten, less known items that most people, you know, aren't aware of. So, Sandy, since we have a little time, Rick should tell, uh, introduce himself, mm -hmm. say where his office is, yes. what his interests sure. are, and that he films these things really more as a uh, he he does much more work than he gets yes, paid. It's a labor for. of love. <laughs> yeah, Rick, come up and tell her because okay. he has his own and business. And please tell why you're so uh, why my husband should be so proud to know. Oh, um, University of Florida. Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah, I graduated University of Florida in '91, uh, telecommunication production. Moved to Stewart in '95. Worked at Mark Memorial. And a funny story with Sandy is. The first HR person I met was her daughter, uh, Jenny, and basically took me through the HR process when I was hired back in 95. I then left in uh, 2005, and I have a video production company. It's right above Maria's Cafe and Clamshell Clothiers in downtown, right down the street. Been the there. home building. Yeah, the Dahan building, building, another historical building. The only one with the elevator, the first elevator was there. Yeah, 1948, I believe. Uh, 52. A 52. Yeah, the first elevator in Mark County. Uh, but I do small video productions. I, uh, you know, being a downtown, um, not only business owner, but I live right off of uh, Kruger Parkway and 
in East Ocean for 20 years now at house. And I joined the Stewart Main Street Board when I moved to uh, downtown Stewart office. And so I've been a member of Stewart Main Street for nine years and that's kind of how I met Alice and, and Sandy, I think through that, I might have met Sandy before that. Um, and I just uh, like to be involved with the community and, and when um, I think Alice asked me to film the meetings, I was happy to do it because we want to preserve, you know, I'm a supporter of preserving history. So all these talks that happen, uh, they're going to get forgotten unless you film them. You know, you can have stories, the stories get changed verbally, but if you have it on tape, have it on DVD, um, they'll be available. And we do make, um, make them available through the, uh, through the museum, and if you ever want a copy or back, back copies, I don't know how many years back, I've been doing it three or four years, and I think Tully was doing it before that, I'm not sure how many uh, years back, some of these videos are available, and they're great to have. So, yeah, if you ever have a video of me, I'm right in downtown Stewart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The name of your business is? Uh, Treasure Coast Multimedia. Yeah, Thank right you. above Maria's Cafe, second floor. In fact, I overlook Haney Circle. Yeah, it has a wonderful view of it. And I have a, I have a, I don't know if any of you during the hurricane, it got pretty popular. I have a live webcam that looks over at Haney Circle and Duffy's. And uh, actually, it, all, it went down only about an hour during Hurricane Dorian. Uh, I was able to come down. Uh, Comcast had an issue, but they got it uh, fixed pretty quickly. I had calls from Pennsylvania and emails asking where the camera was. And it's nice because it's a live stream. People from out of town wanted to know what was happening in downtown Stewart. And it's a great shot if you ever want to go to it. It's stewartwebcam.com. And you can see what's going on in downtown Stewart. Fantastic. And ironically, his office, his window, is the same one that Tom's dad's office was. When oh, that's he right. He yeah. broke off from Prairie and his, he still kept his office. That was there. That's great. The original thrill of office. Yeah, in, wow. the, in the Behan building. Oh, really? That's a great building. I enjoyed being there. I've been there for 10 years. And he collects gaming memorabilia. It's like a shrine to gators with yeah. uh, Ted Tebow, big thing. Even the non gators <laughs> fan are impressed with it. So. Uh, thank you. Well, thank I have you so much. Remember, if you've got any suggestions or ideas, let Mary know the programs you'd like to hear or see come up in the future, too. You know, especially if you've got ideas as guest speakers. So please let Mary know on this idea. Okay. Thank you so much.